I want to take a moment to thank our main sponsor, SunGrow, who is uh, helping make this event, all of this event, the 22nd, the 29th, and next week, May 6th, free for you to view. So we're grateful for SunGrow. We also are grateful for Radiant Reet. Radiant Reet is the track sponsor. Today is our innovation track. And we're talking about how innovation is helping to not only stimulate the clean energy economy, uh, but what do we see happening around innovation from business models to products in the clean energy, clean, clean economy space. Uh, I'm going to take a moment to bring on our esteemed guests for today. My name is Nico Johnson. If you haven't tuned in before, I have a podcast called Suncast, which is the name of our company, Suncast Media. Uh, and I have interviewed the three folks that we are going to have on our panel today. Starting with Beck, Josh Beck is from BCI Technology Investment. BCI Technologies has been an investor in many different uh, hardware and innovation ideas. Is that we've brought to market clean energy. Maybe you're probably familiar with Next Tracker as one such company. I led the investment round on Josh Beck is the managing director at BCI, chief innovation officer, or chief investment officer, and uh, has a lot of deep thought around how uh, startups can scale their companies with clean tech investment. Jim Spano is no stranger to uh, Suncast. He's also no stranger to innovation. Uh, he has been involved in clean energy and clean tech for many years as a financial advisor and also as a solar developer. He is a subject matter expert as recognized by the state of New Jersey and many other, uh, and has helped push policies and uh, many, many projects forward, many hundreds of megawatts of solar de deployed by Jim and his investment team. He has an innovative new platform uh, that we are grateful to highlight here called Radiant REIT which itself is a first investment uh, helping the solar energy industry lower their cost of cap. And certainly last but not least, uh, we hope that Mona Dejani is going to be able to join us. Mona is the first ever uh, director of a big uh, top five law firm as a female. She is a, uh, a deal maker extraordinaire, was featured on one of our past Suncast episodes and is a an all-around, uh, as we mentioned in our title for her episode, uh, deal-making badass. Mona has uh, a long history of crafting deals and is one of the area experts in law around not only how to get clean energy deals done, but how to structure a deal properly. Their global per perspective on supply chain uh, and investment is uh, much needed at a time where many in our industry are wondering what's next, what's around the corner, and how do we move forward. So with that, I'd like to bring in Josh Beck and Jim Spano. Hey guys, how you doing? Great. How are you doing, Nico? Pleasure Fantastic. To you. Looking forward to this conversation. Yeah. Likewise, Josh. Uh, for those who um, who are following along live. I uh, want to remind you that you can put your questions in the comments or in the Q&A uh, section of Crowdcast as we will have an opportunity towards the end of this session to engage in questions from the audience. Oh, look, we have one more to add. The wonderful to see you, Mona. Hey. Mona, I'm, <laughs> I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that in a time where we have... Uh, where everyone is working from home and we have IT challenges abound that we're able to push uh, an, an IT team at a, at a company like Pillsbury uh, beyond their comfort level and get you into our, get you into our, our broadcast platform. <laughs> this is what it's, this is what it's like to navigate these, uh, these tough economic times. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, I'd like to, uh, as I see you all on the screen, I, I presume the audience as well sees, uh, we've got Josh Beck, uh, top right, Jim Spano, bottom right, and the lovely Mona Johnny in the bottom left. Uh, I'd like to start with you, Josh, and help the audience understand uh, a little bit more about BCI technology, your <laughs> perspective on the market, sort of where you fit in the market, and then we'll go to Jim and Mona in, in turn. 
Yeah, sure. So uh, we are a hundred million dollar uh, venture capital funds. Uh, we provide a lot of kind of strategic uh, supply chain resources designed for manufacturing, cost out engineering support to our companies. We generally invest in companies that have uh, finished their pilot or demonstration project phase, uh, had a successful seed round, and um, are really launching their first sophisticated A or B round of investment. Um, Generally, what we find is that the companies that we invest in are past the kind of core technology risk phase that's been validated. And what they're really looking for is a strong strategic partner who both uh, financially and operationally can provide value added support to help them kind of manage a vertical hockey stick, really get their first first real products, viable products in the market. Fantastic. Jim with Radiant Reit, uh, not only our track sponsor, but, uh, but someone who has been an innovator across many categories in our industry. Jim, could you give us an idea about the work that you guys are engaged in? Sure. Radiant Reit is the first solar mortgage REIT in the U.S. We launched about a year and a half ago, and we uh, have a financial solution for developers that enables developers to capture the value they're creating during their development cycles. Um, enabling them to take projects through COD as opposed to the typical NTP transaction um, where developers exit out of their out of their projects and uh, don't really capture the full value that they've created and, the, and that value goes to the capital provider. So by providing those developers with the capital necessary to get to that point of uh, development, uh, we enable them to capture that value and significantly improve their positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that ability to have access to that sort of liquidity for those who are unfamiliar with how the solar project development cycles work, to unlock that capital, have it back in the development cycle is indeed innovative. And it's a great way, to, uh, you know, I, I kind of look at the work that Radiant is doing as, uh, as analogous to the work that Sun Edison did with bringing the, the PPA model to solar, right? You're unlocking another well-established uh, finance or capital market model and applying it to the niche of solar energy. So I love that and uh, I, I want to make sure that folks understand kind of where each person fits. Last but certainly not least is Mona who spends a lot of time on uh, thinking about deal structure, capital structure, etc. Mona, you run the global energy practice for Pillsbury. Can you give us a little more insight into what that means? Sure. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. I'm in a uh, I uh, I'm in a bunker. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so uh, Pillsbury, Winthrop, Shaw, Pittman. We are a global law firm. Uh, I sit in the New York and London offices, and uh, I lead a team of lawyers in all facets of renewable energy soup to nuts. Uh, we've been involved on uh, most of the major deals that you see in the papers, as well as uh, smaller deals, equally as important, uh, but uh, very, very happy and uh, uh, to join the, the cast with you, Nico. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to have you here, Mona. And, uh, you know, I want to ask just for the audience to Please bear with us if we do have some technical difficulties. We're pulling people in from all parts of the world. I myself am uh, beaming our signal from uh, the re a remote part of Mexico. Uh, not not necessarily stuck here, um, but we have been here and uh, and choose not to come back to the U.S. during this crazy pandemic time. So um, it's great. It's wonderful that we can pull uh, four people in who uh, who in their in their in some way are experts on the subject of uh, navigating this economic crisis. Uh, for my part, I was running my first ever company when the global financial crisis hit, and um, and that was itself a very uh, learn a, a deep learning experience. Um, as our previous uh, the guest in our previous panel, John Bonanno said, is you succeed uh, or fail based on three things: uh, having the right team, having the right capital structure, and understanding your audience. And uh, and in our case, we had the right uh, capital structure and team or rather uh, audience and team, we didn't have the right capital structure. So we're gonna talk a bit today about business model, <laughs> about, about how a uh, global financial crisis or a pandemic can disrupt that business model. It's been 10 years 
of a bull market and positive momentum for clean tech investment. As we head now into an un, uh, uncertain time, which is um, most, in, most definitely going to be a bear market and likely a recession, many companies find themselves struggling with capital raise and operating capital. Uh, you all have managed through the last economic recession. You've managed through this bull market. And I expect that we'll be able to glean some insights from your experience. Jim, I'd like to start uh, with you because uh, back in uh, 2009, 2010, you were still at, functioning, as, I'm, as I recall, as a financial uh, analyst and serving private clients, helping them structure uh, their businesses. And you saw the opportunity with clean energy. Um, from the perspective of someone who was transitioning into the clean energy business during an economic recession, what advice might you give from your own experience around how to think about the, the, the core business function or the, or the way to preserve capital uh, when you're coming into a, 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 a capital constraint like we see now? Before we look at how we conserve our capital, um, which uh, is a plan, obviously a planning process. I think the first thing that we have to look at is um, how our businesses are structured and are they structured in a way that can, can survive a downturn. Um, I think a lot of people live hand to mouth. They run their businesses the same way. And when times get difficult, um, they collapse. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that now. We're seeing in New Jersey, I'm seeing solar companies shutting down left and right uh, as a result of this pandemic, particularly in the, in the resi space where people don't want them in their homes. Um, I, I try to use an analogy. Um, when you're facing a tough time and you can look past the horizon and see that there's going to be some, some roller coaster rides or what we like to call the solar coaster in our industry, um, one of the first things that you really need to do is consider the path that you're going to take. I liken it to a, a track up, a, a, a up and down a mountain. When you're going up the mountain and you're looking up the, at the top of the mountain and you're at the bottom, it seems like an insurmountable uh, 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 challenge. But as you go up that mountain and you hit plateau and then you get to the next plateau and you take it step at a time, each little step is very surmountable and, and you, can, you can achieve those. When you get to the top of that mountain and you look back behind you and you look at all those steps down, it looks like a very simple climb. It doesn't look nearly as difficult when you're on the bottom looking up. So if you take it from the perspective of when you're, when you're, when you're at that and you're facing that mountain, instead of looking up, envision yourself in the top of that mountain looking down and at all the steps that it took to get back to that top. To me, that's the way that you need to approach a downturn in the market because every downturn is followed by an upturn. That's the cyclical nature of business. So if you bear that in mind, I think that you're going to be able to survive far more readily than, than the typical business owner who sees that insurmountable and either gives up or uh, uh, turns and, and heads the other way. Um, so I think that's the first thing that we have to look at. Obviously, from a capital structure, when things get difficult, one of the cash is king. I mean, that's a saying we've all heard. We've all lived by it. Um, if, you, if you've preserved cash and you've maintained a, a reasonable capital position, you're going to be able to get through that downturn. And you're going to be able to not only get through the downturn, but take advantage of the following up cycle. And that's really the key to a successful business development. It's not just... When times are good, we're good. And when times are bad, we tighten our belts. When times are bad, that's when we're looking for those opportunities because we know that cycles change. Yeah, indeed. Uh, and boy, are cycles changing. Uh, I think that one of the interesting things uh, I'm hearing in the marketplace is actually less from the perspective of what's going on with um, with the, the small to medium enterprises uh, that are providing a service, providing a good or installing solar on residences and commercial um, uh, sites. The utility scale projects are, seem to be still tracking forward on the solar side. Uh, you know, Josh and the BCI team, from my view, have a really interesting insight. I know, Josh, you spent a lot of time on the phone in March reaching out to your constituents, both on the investor side as well as on the, uh, the customer side, where, where I'm seeing 
a big, uh, perhaps a big um, question mark is uh, precisely what we talked about in the previous panel. This, uh, the segment of the market that is trying to bring already difficult to uh, scale hardware businesses uh, to market. And they were in many ways depending on not only customer um, demo projects, et cetera, but investment. Josh, what are you, uh, what are you seeing right now from uh, the perspective as a fund who is actively looking at supporting uh, entrepreneurs and enterprise that was looking for that product market fit or had it and was looking to mm -hmm. scale? Yeah, great question, Nico. I think that you know, from we're still actively deploying capital um, as as we you know talking to different groups at at uh, NREL and across the industry. We're we're also seeing that people seem to be uh, slightly scaling back their deployment of private capital uh, from venture capitals and private equity firms. However, it's 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 not major. Um, there there are additional risks in terms of runway. I think that. A lot of uh, a lot of people in the investment community are are really trying to focus in on um, companies that are a little bit more demonstrating that they can be more capital efficient in in a lean time, um, and and especially companies that are focusing more on companies that have an eighteen month runway. That seems to be the the magic number. So my I would encourage any entrepreneurs out there who are who are leading the way with their with their companies try to you know, take a take a sharp pencil to to your budgets and try to figure out how you can demonstrate that yes we can live for the next 18 months off of this uh, after what's what's already in the bank account here we can we can find ways to pivot into consulting services or value added support for us to be able to bring in some low level revenue while we continue to develop our our, our long term vision of a product um, what we also see is that. There's a lot of people, keep in mind that there's a lot of high net worth individuals across the United States and corporate partners who have, who have pulled their money from public markets, right? This is an incredible opportunity for both hardware and software companies that are in the early stage of growth. I mean, I, I was talking to a family office not long ago who said, listen, we made a lot of money in the year, over the years in oil and gas. Um, we're, we're fine to take a bath, even with the price per barrel of oil right now. We pulled out of public markets and now we've got... $200 million that we're ready to deploy into renewable energy. That's really exciting. So we're really looking for companies with entrepreneurs that are demonstrating leadership, that uh, certainly are able to pull back their line of sight, uh, kind of going back to Jim's analogy of the mountain. I think that is spot on. But entrepreneurs that can really take a step back, look at the macro market conditions, and really be able to go back to the fundamentals of their business plan do a new risk and opportunity assessment and what we're finding is those are the entrepreneurs that are really impressing this new wave and that's what's exciting about this we're seeing the opportunity is that there's a new wave of invest investors actually entering private markets and a and b round investing specifically because they're worried about having their money in the public markets right now so there's a, a true opportunity that is really really exciting and i want to circle back to that new wave in a moment uh, Mona, you have uh, a, a, a different and I'll say a much more macro view from a global perspective, not only as I mentioned before, you're the first female uh, head of energy for a major law practice, but you've been uh, coming at this idea of deal structuring uh, from a different perspective than what we typically think of from someone with that Esquire tag on their name. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar and maybe didn't listen to your episode on Suncast, you are an engineer by training and, uh, and have a real deep understanding of how, uh, of how not only to architect the narrative around, um, around contract structure, but also around company structure. I wanted to see if you see that thanks to uh, the pandemic and the, na the nature of the, uh, the very response models that many different countries are deploying notably uh you know the nordic countries as an example are responding quite differently to how they navigate the the pandemic and the economic downturn how do you see from a global perspective uh each country's response affecting their ability to invest not only in ongoing projects but to attract capital to attract talent, to move forward uh, as though, maybe we say, as though nothing were, were happening. What's your perspective on that? Yeah, the uh, what I'm seeing is that 
that different countries are reacting, as you just said, Nico, differently. Uh, and uh, it's, it's interesting to see what I'm... Uh, so, and I think that their response with respect to COVID has really affected their uh, perspective on how they're dealing with uh, investments in the United States. You know, for example, I have a lot of clients in uh, the Nordic uh, European area, Denmark, Norway, and such, and uh, their, their, their countries are, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're handling it differently. They're not hit as hard as we are, and they are full steam ahead and actually very much looking at the United States and investing here and going full forward, even though our offices are closed, many of the uh, rec uh, local recording offices are closed. We are uh, still putting deals together and going full force. And we have to remind them sometimes that here in the United States, particularly New York City, where I sit, most of the time is closed and uh but we're still moving forward we're closing deals uh it was it's been uh, a really great ride so i think that different countries are uh based on their initial reaction to covid is having a profound effect on their investment here in the u.s i could tell you also like uh spain uh, is starting to, to ramp up. Uh, I had other clients in Italy. They're still kind of underground. Uh, they're at least from what I'm seeing on my deal flows. So uh, it's it's very important to take in consideration these uh, foreign countries and their uh, responses to COVID on how they are seeing our space at least. Uh, uh, cross-border investments here in the U.S. Yeah, I'm curious if there is, uh, there's a couple of topics that I know that we want to get to. Um, one is around debt and equity and the overall investment structure there, what we're mm -hmm. seeing in the market. Another is around supply chain. Um, I wanted to take a moment to remind those who are watching live that if you're on LinkedIn or another social platform, we're grabbing those comments and pulling them in so that we can uh, use them in an interactive session in a few moments with our panel. So feel free to ask your questions. Don't uh, lean on uh, my ability to probe and pry great ideas out of these guys. I would ask that, uh, use this as an interactive opportunity. I'd love to hear from you, the audience, what you would like to know from uh, our esteemed panel as well. Uh, before we jump into uh, the debt and equity discussion, I'd love to hear if you all have any anecdotal evidence that the uh, that the inv that investments are in fact moving forward. What is it, what does this uh, current macro environment mean for big, well-funded companies versus small, perhaps not so well-funded companies? Any commentary there? Yeah. I well, uh, Apologies. Josh, Let's go. go. That's fine. I'll go after you. <laughs> sure. You know, I think that one of the interesting things about this is it, it's uh, large company, small company, well funded, or kind of sc scraping by. You know, it's all about being able to master the pivot, as we've talked about before, uh, Nico. We're we're actually finding that the companies that are having the hardest time right now are those that decided not to launch an equity round this year because they were already slightly revenue positive. And they're like, you know what? We don't need to give up any more founders equity. We can really, really scrape by based off of top line revenue. And what we're finding is that that top line revenue has disappeared and they really weren't prepared. They weren't fully engaged with a group of sophisticated investors who were ready to deploy capital into them. So then they're re-educating an investor base. And it's gonna take them another six, eight, 12 months in order to raise the capital they need. So in those situations, we're seeing a lot of furloughs and, and layoffs. Um, or just full stops. Uh, the companies that were slightly behind that curve actually are in great shape. Uh, companies that were already into a full funding cycle, uh, companies that were really, really doing deep dives into their business planning um, and and moving quickly and pivoting. What we're finding, what we're finding is that we're we're telling our companies that um, 
look at what your true strengths are. And if your strength is no one's expecting you to be a Fortune 500 company with a billion dollar um, of free cash flow that you can kind of deploy to kind of weather the storm. So then your true ability to be able to uh, be agile and flexible. You might find as a as a early stage company that your technology that was incredibly viable, you know, six months ago, uh, it, it might be a solution without a problem. Um, but then that that doesn't mean that there's not new opportunities to kind of deploy that into new market segments and take advantage of that. Luna, over to you. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that, uh, Josh, I completely agree with everything that you said, uh, and I'm seeing that in the deals that I'm that I'm working on now. Uh, I'd like to also say that you know those companies that are well capitalized are doing very well. Those smaller companies that are less capitalized but are very nimble and strategic and very focused and surgical on uh, who they want to uh, partner with are doing exceptionally well as well. So um, I, I just want to leave the message that uh, those that are thinking outside the box and are really uh, looking at this whole pandemic as an opportunity to uh, approach their deals differently. And maybe a competitor really is not really a competitor. They could, we could, uh, they could work together with them. There's another angle that they can apply. They're doing well. Uh, I also believe in, in a V you know, the a V shape recovery too, as well, uh, when this is, Hopefully over soon. Yeah, indeed. Uh, Jim, I will welcome your anecdotal uh, inter sort of intersection as well, but I wanted to start uh, sort of kick off the tax equity and debt question as well uh, with you giving an answer. The avail availability of tax equity and debt it seems to be bifurcating. And I'm curious, what does that mean for investors who are interested in, in particular, solar during the uncertain months ahead? Sure. As anybody in the uh, industry knows now, tax equity has become a significant consideration. Um, with the uncertainty in the in the tax laws and the COVID crisis, uh, it's created a lot of tax uncertainty, and as a result, there's a lot a lot of delay in commitments. Uh, in fact, right now it's it's almost impossible to get any tax equity investor to make a, a commitment to a project. However. I do believe that uh, the larger banks are still active in the market, but bear in mind that their cycle is such that the deals they're processing now are deals that were done in mid to late 2019 and are now just getting closed. I understand from speaking to some of my colleagues that new deals are still happening on the largest on a on a on a larger size uh, deals with uh, you know uh, Bank of America and, and U.S. Bank and Wells and them. But I don't, there, there's literally a complete dry up in the middle and lower markets for tax equity. Um, in terms of bifurcation, yes, I think there's a lot more debt players that are coming into the market. We're seeing the tenor of debt being, being stretched a little bit out now. Obviously, Radiant, Radiant Reed has has really stretched that that envelope to its to its peak and, and created some vacuum that's backflowing into it and creating a, a, a new uh, demand within the market for longer term debt. Um, but generally speaking, my, my overall view relative to, uh, the impact is that I think our, our side of the industry, the, the utility and even the large CNI is, is still booming. There's, there's no slowdown at all. I think the fact that everybody is working from home, uh, we're all working 12 and 14 hours when before Isn't we were working truth? six. Uh, between travel time and going, uh, so now when you're sitting at home all day long and you can't visit your friends, you're working. So I'm seeing a tremendous amount of deal flow coming from my office, more so than I've ever in my entire career. Um, even Radiant Reek, we've taken in more applications and more uh, uh, subscriptions than, than we would have ever imagined. But I think that's also because as the tax equity markets dry up and, it, and the even the debt markets are, are now uh, looking to delay some of their funding and, and reconsider some of the commitments that are being made. Um, I think there's going to be a, a, a large void and it's going to create a vacuum that's going to bring some new players into the market. Um, I believe there's enough demand for the product and enough capital chasing it.
that you're going to start seeing some of those epic equity players becoming debt players and converting some of that equity risk into debt risk and yet still achieving similar type returns because the equity margins have tightened so much and with debt mar with debt markets now tightening um, I think you're going to see a, a some room for some new debt providers to make the market. Anyone else want to tag on on the tax equity and debt conversation? Yeah, I agree with everything Jim said. I mean, it's it's very consistent with exactly what mm -hmm. I'm seeing. Uh, so, so thank you, Jim. Those are very good <laughs> comments. You know, one of the things that, uh, in particular, you know, BCI being a division of a, um, you know, well-known concern that has a deep understanding of global supply chain. Josh, I'm curious your thoughts, and I know for sure Mona and Jim are going to have some comments on this. Uh, but one of the questions I see being asked most, in fact, folks are asking us, hey, when are you going to do an episode on this around Suncast mm -hmm. is what's happening to the global supply chain? One of the things that we saw in the 2010 downturn uh, was this impact of the supply chain, but more so now with COVID-19, mm -hmm. the fact that manufacturing has all but stopped and we're just starting to see companies, mm -hmm. you know, solar panel manufacturers, um, battery uh, manufacturing plants starting to come back online. Mm -hmm. What do we expect to be the immediate near-term impact? And are there gonna be follow-on ripples Number one, to the ability to actually deploy product and projects, but number two, uh, how will that impact the overall investment cycle and investment structure? Yeah, that's that's right. We better block out a day to talk about this, right? Um, but, uh, <laughs> but I think the short the short answer to that is, you know, we're really on uncharted waters uh, coming out of the last debt crisis. Um, you know, this this particular wave has been compounded by where, you know, we were already in a, a very active trade war um, with with China. So so I think that a variety of companies of different sizes are taking a variety of different approaches. What we're what we at a macro level are seeing is that China seems to be about 80, 85 percent back online from the production perspective. Um, they're, they're really being stressed out on the medical device, obviously, side of things and medical consumables. Um, and, and they're pulling a lot of bandwidth. Uh, from other industries into production into those sectors. However, on the renewable energy side, the the torque tubes, the I beams, all the things for the big utility and CNI scale projects, the inverters, all those things, they're still rolling off the assembly lines, and those are kind of can considered critical to Chinese national security interests to keep the modules and everything flowing. So uh, for export purposes, uh, what what we're seeing kind of at an individual company kind of as a trend, right, is that companies are really taking a uh, of, of companies of both large and small are taking a closer look at what their supply chain strategy is. Uh, before, I think that uh, companies were heavily weighted of consolidating their supply chain exclusively within China. What we're seeing now is, all right, this is kind of the one two punch between the trade war and COVID. We should probably look for ways to diversify um, our supply chains internationally and domestically so that we can kind of mitigate risk and that'll help us kind of be a little bit more agile and pivot into the future. So we're seeing a lot of activity and churn of supply chains, uh, maybe maybe not entirely, but maybe 20, 30 percent of their supply chains gravitating into Malaysia or Korea or Vietnam or Thailand. Uh, we're seeing people take the early steps of moving their supply chains back to the United States, understanding that they're losing some of their, their cost compatibility, uh, competitiveness and, and capabilities. Um, while U.S. manufacturers are tooling up and maybe they're paying a premium for a U.S. made product, um, but then trying to eke out savings on reduced um, regionalized logistics charges, right? So we're seeing a lot of new strategies emerging. One thing I think is going to be actually great for our sector as a whole from a supply chain logistics perspective is that I think that people are thinking of this really more strategically, right? So uh, people are actually, executive teams are sitting down, they're saying, all right, listen, we were working with this one really great Chinese manufacturer. Now we need to be working with three or four different manufacturers. What does that mean from an operational process and an operational cost perspective? How does that drop to the bottom line of what we're quoting uh, into projects that people are actually deploying? So I think it makes it a lot more complicated, but I think in the long run, it's gonna make it a lot more robust. I get a, a, a little consideration too. I think 
in the long term, we might see some further disruption, not necessarily just from the supply chain, but from the raw material perspective. Mm -hmm. There's a certain uh, uh, concentration of raw materials that are needed for our industry specific. Um, and I think that that the slowdown has, has supported a supply of that material existing, but without the labor uh, out mining and, and operating uh, to, to pull those raw materials into uh, manufacturing plants, I think we might see some, I, I'd show some concern that in a longer period, there might be some further delays as a result of that. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, there's a, um, you know, there's a, there's a, ma a macro question that I posed even in the naming of, of this session and certainly the conversations that we had uh, coming into sort of prepping for this time. Um, I'm really interested to hear what business models, uh, you know, we mentioned uh, PPAs were one of the things that sort of boomed in uh, onto the market. The way that residential finance uh, for homeowners was structured around 2010, 2011, really was innovative moving from PPAs to lease models and starting to see more traditional banking financing models come to, come to fruition. Uh, Jim, you guys have uh, this, you know, the REIT model. Can we have a, a, a brief dialogue around potential business model shifts that we're seeing in the marketplace, either from the way that uh, organizations are thinking about working together, uh, all the way to uh, sort of a re, uh, rethinking of the structure, not only of the capital, but the businesses. Mona, I know that you've had some deep discussions with your clients around this as well. Okay, I guess I'll, I'll start with uh, making a, a very quick analogy. Solar systems, we've all established from the Hand and Armstrong ruling, we all recognize them as real estate. But we didn't treat them as real estate. What Radiant Reed has done is it's, it's um, obtained the affirmations necessary from the IRS to quantify and classify a, a solar system mortgage, not the solar system itself now, the solar system mortgage as real estate. And by having that classified as real estate, now it's being treated and financed under traditional real estate terms. We're recognizing the asset life of our asset class. Um, we're matching our debt now to that asset class. The only real distinction between an, a solar play in, in terms of a mortgage REIT and a real estate play in terms of a mortgage REIT is that the solar system has a, a in all instances, has currently a, a an ITC, a, a tax consideration that normally you don't see in real estate unless you're doing historic uh, 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 credits or, or you know very specific areas within the real estate industry. The broad solar industry all has that same complication that isn't in a traditional uh, real estate play. Once we solve that, and I believe that the phase out of the ITC is pretty much self uh, fulfilling that phase out. Once that's phased out, what's left? Well, there's a sliver of the capital stack that's missing a big chunk of that sliver. Debt's going to have to fill that in. That's the only alternative. And the only way that you can get the high LTVs in order to do that is to recognize the, the asset life and to be able to finance it and have your cash flows and your debt services based on the actual asset life of, of the uh, asset itself. So I think the, the fact that there is now a product out in the market that is not just a mortgage REIT, and, and that's, let's be careful to make that distinction. It's a completely new financing paradigm. We're enabling now that developer to finance that project, cradle to grave, before they even construct the project, creating a significant amount of value that they can go and leverage into the markets. That's enabling those developers now to significantly increase their development activities because they have eliminated the capital constraint that has prevented them in the past. In order to, to get a project finance, you have to you have to pay upfront legal fees. You have diligence expenses. Uh, you first of all, you have to go through a large expense to get a project to NTP before you can even finance it. Um, Radiant Re recognizes that once you've uh, achieved NTP and you've created that value, that that's equity. And we can leverage that equity with our debt and enable that developer to have full, uh, full 
access to the capital necessary to take that project all the way through its asset life. Mona, over to you. And uh, yeah, I was going to add, uh, you know, on a on an even bigger macro level, uh, and I don't know if this is because of the current COVID environment that we're in, but. Uh, what I'm seeing is a lot of unconventional uh, joint ventures, and I kind of alluded this at the beginning of our uh, podcast, where I was talking about, uh, you know, uh, there is a new paradigm I'm seeing about those that are becoming super successful and actually taking advantage of being in this uh, environment, and those are those companies that are, uh, they could have been former competitors and they're forming joint ventures in a strategic fashion and they're putting together uh, portfolios of, you know, projects where they can control the supply. So they are, uh, because uh, depending on what side you're in, they're going to be, you know, someone ultimately is going to have to take the risk, the force majeure risk on the supply chain issues that we talked about. So uh, how do you best uh, deal with that from a contractual perspective? And that really uh, boils down to trust with the counterparties and actually forming a joint venture and going out as a unit to uh, de-risk uh, projects in this, uh, especially with the supply chain issues in this kind of environment. So um, there's a whole new paradigm that I'm seeing and people are, companies are working together uh, and uh, trying to get uh, deals done. I think uh, like everyone else on this uh, panel, I have been working twice as hard because it's there's so much business there's so many deals that are being created uh because because they're driven by okay you know we're uh we we have time constraints and we don't want to you know dilly let's you know life moves on let's let's go forward so contrary to the rest of our of the news in the economy that you're seeing in this renewable space there's, there's a lot of deals. There's a lot of deal flow uh, uh, so long as you're willing to participate in this uh, different paradigm. So Just back to you, I think I, uh, yes. I could add a little into that. I, I think the strategic partnering that uh, Mona is discussing is the exact, that's, that's the only way to succeed in this market. Mm -hmm. Spano, uh, my, my other company, Spano Partners, if, if you go to mm -hmm. our website, Strategic partnering is our is the whole philosophy of our company. At Reedy and Reed, we're basically what what are we doing? We're partnering with developers to provide them the capital that heretofore equity partners, equity investors they were partnering with. We're now partnering with debt, so it's the same concept, only under new financing and, and new structures that that uh, are becoming available to the market. Yeah, I couldn't agree couldn't agree more with both Mona and Jim. I think that one of the uh, just my my personal feeling is that I think we're all working a lot more hours as well because we're all trying to multiply plan. For, we're all trying to plan at the same time for multiple scenarios unfolding, right? Yeah. So then that kind of we're not chasing one business plan; we're chasing four business plans at the same time. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs can relate with that. Probably who are listening today, uh, completely agree. I think that what I'm seeing kind of as a macro market trend in terms of a business structure has been in. in I think it's just kind of trickling down from long-term asset owners. We got to remember that a lot of the assets that are in the fields now are starting to turn 5, 10, 15 years old at the at the oldest or 13, 15 years old, right? And uh, what we're starting to see is this kind of request coming down for more fully what I'm hearing, the, the term fully wrapped services, right? So all these asset owners, they're starting to run into these buzz saws where it's like, all right, there's something wrong with the with the racking. No, it's the it's the peers. Go after those guys. And then you go after the peer guys. No, go after the geotech guys. They got it wrong. So everyone's kind of pointing their fingers at each other like this. And I think that what we're seeing is that a really successful business model in this particular environment are these kind of joint ventures and these collaborative business relationships with 
as you had said, Mona, what used to be competitors might be collaborators now, showing that, listen, we're not a one, we're not a one trick pony here. We can actually diversify. We can, we can help solve multiple problems all underneath one banner and we can wrap that under one warranty claim or one insurance program. And I think that that's really going to be the future of the industry is, is a consolidation of resources across strategic partnerships. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really, yeah, that's a really interesting insight as well. Um, I want to be conscious of our time here, probably uh, give another five or maybe 10 minutes max uh, as we're bumping up against the, the next session, which is actually talking about tax equity. And um, our, no, don't worry if you're jumping off to that one and want to watch that. Not only is this being recorded, you can come back and watch it again, but the other one is being recorded. So you're in luck. We're gonna, you're going to be able to see all of this. There's no need to feel rushed uh, or constrained. I have a few questions from the audience that I know they are uh, anxiously awaiting answers to and we'll start with the first one it's from Catherine Burke uh, and it's directed to you Josh Josh how can we can you speak a little for, can you speak further to um, <laughs> sorry a little technical difficulty with, this, with the ticker there to the 18 month runway why 18 months can you extrapolate on that yeah so 18 months I think is is proving out uh, that's kind of a core fundamental principle within um, uh, within investing uh, specifically because 18 months gives you the proper timeline in order to react to a changing market condition right if you need to pivot your business model if you find that the technology that you're working on that someone maybe beat you to the punch uh, maybe maybe you're you're getting in through your customer discovery and they're asking for something else and you need to go back to the drawing board. 18 months of engagement uh, within a within a funding cycle allows you to launch a, a successful funding round. It allows you to re-engage re your strategic advisors, your board, to really kind of come up with what the pivot should really look like and do it in a sophisticated way. No one wants to invest in someone who looks like they're in panic mode or if they're scrambling or if they're just making it up as they go, right? And let's all be honest here. Everyone in the world is making it up as they go right now just because we. no one knows who's going to be president here in November. No one knows what's going to happen here with COVID-19, right? We're all trying to plan for these multiple scenarios, like I said, at the same time. So I think that this really strengthens, um, you know, I think if you don't have 18 months, that doesn't mean that, that um, all is lost. It's just one thing that investors are looking for, and that's why it's kind of proven out to be true. And it gives you that time. I think that regardless of whether you have the 18 months of burn left or, or six months of burn, it is just absolutely fundamentally critical that you're engaging your board of advisors and your strategic partners and you're, you're going to the people that you trust for counsel and you're really having candid conversations with them. What you're going to find is those are going to be your best friends right now and those are the people, the people who can speak the truth and really allow you to soundboard opinions and provide you guidance. Those are the people that you should really be circling the rack, wagons around at the moment. Yeah, I want to uh, bring up the next question, which is by Cliff Henry. And Cliff wants to know, where's the best place, therefore, to raise capital for a new startup, say maybe 10 million in equity? I would add to that, are we seeing uh, a readjustment of adjustment of expectations about what's possible to be raised? Right. And I'll turn it over to the other panelists, but I, I would just engage on that last comment that I said. I think that the best place to go to raise $10 million or any dollar amount is your board of advisors and, and, and strategic advisors. They might not be able to whip out their checkbooks and write that check personally for you, but it's all about leveraging your professional networks. And, and by surrounding yourselves by people with larger professional networks than yours, hey, listen, I know that myself and every other investor I know, they make investments and give a, a serious look and consideration towards investment into a company when it is personally suggested by someone within their network. Right. And that is going to be uh, the biggest thing. If someone who's close to you can reference you into someone who can write a check, then then you've done a lot of the work right up front. That goes back to what Mona was saying in terms of trust. If you've got a relationship and it's a referral from a relationship and there's an element of trust there, we're more inclined to put the time and effort into determining whether it's a real opportunity or not. Yeah. And, and I just want to add that just briefly, just to add um, and amplify what Josh and Jim just said, that we, you know, as an advisor, professional advisor, what, what, what I do is I put together companies to work together. And you should be leveraging those networking relationships that you have 
to uh, take advantage of the, of, you know, where to invest the money, listen to them, uh, hear them out, and then evaluate. I think that it's really, it's very difficult to do that. And it's just like with you, Nico, you were able to put together this whole podcast in uh, record time. I don't know how you did it. What, three weeks? Uh, That's right. But I know you, and I know you can do that. I already know you done it before you so uh you're you're extraordinary in that in that uh in that regard but yes leverage the relationship leverage the uh networking of your uh trusted advisors i uh well first of all thank you so much for mentioning that mona um yeah we did pull it together in three weeks and it's in no small part are due to my own ingenuity of leveraging our networks. Uh, as, as I showed you before, I mean, the sponsors, including Radiant Reed, um, were the first people that I called and said, I had this idea. I called Josh because we were supposed to be in Pittsburgh together presenting at the Clean Energy Forum uh, at, at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and so that sort of quick action is exactly what keeps companies afloat when the econ economy is, is turning in a different direction. You know, one of the things at a macro level, and I want to use this as our final question, I think it's apropos that, uh, that Luis Morales brings in, is in the current environment, has C-19 actually caused the investment community to focus or less on renewable climate related steps? We'll go, go around the horn. We'll go Josh. Jim and finish with Mona. Well, there's the computer there, Josh, I'll get you. Or yeah. Start yeah. back over. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, um, I think that my, my assessment is more. I think that people are looking for what the what the crest of the wave or what the horizon looks like, and that's renewable energy. We're still looking at a north of 20% CAGR for the utility scale solar industry in the United States, and that's going to continue. Uh, I don't see that changing, and I think that people are excited to see what's next coming out of this. I think that um, our industry is uniquely positioned for the, the, the most rapid incline in business. When we talk about that hockey stick, we're at the very bottom of that hockey stick right now. We're, we're poised to be the economic stimulus, the job creation industry that's gonna turn this country around. I'm gonna use my own state here in New Jersey. Our governor just a couple of days ago uh, passed his new uh, reopening and, and his economic stimulus recovery plan and it's predicated on our industry being the engine that's going to drive that growth. So I think we're going to see that going across the country as states have developed 100% RPSs. Logically, what does that mean? It means even if the even if the ITC gets reduced and economics aren't there, then the states are going to step in and provide the incentive. So I think that we're in a very unique position. I think that the COVID-19 is actually, and, and I, I think I did a, a, a Woods McKenzie uh, interview on this recently. I think the the uh, COVID crisis, as terrible as it sounds, is going to be one of the driving forces in, in the growth of our industry. Um, and, and and I think it should be. I think we're we're in a unique position to address the infrastructure needs of our country at a time when we need job creation and we need to put people to work, and we have a climate problem. So. It all just circles into the perfect storm for our industry. Yeah, I will just add uh, to those the excellent points, Jim. Uh, you know, I look at this and what I'm seeing now in our space is uh, the outlook very, very bullish. Uh, this is an absolute catalyst for uh, not only our industry, but also a focus, a particular focus on climate, our world, our, and how interrelated our uh, uh, you know, planet is and uh, what, what also uh, happened to oil and uh, what uh, in terms of uh, the extreme job creation that could be uh, also with the stimulus, not only with New Jersey and New York and Virginia too, there's other here in the US, but also we look at this globally and uh, really believe that uh, this put a highlight on, uh, unfortunately this pandemic put a highlight on how 
we need to, our world needs to focus on science, needs to focus on health and clean energy and the future of our planet. And we are uh, all just trying to uh, help the rest of the world see not only is this saving our planet, but also it's leaving it better for our children, grandchildren, and the rest of the world. So, and, and we can make money. Yeah. And we can make money. Yeah, that's right. And that ultimate, it's, it's ultimately why many of us did get into this industry, right? Is that we can make good yeah. doing good. We can, yeah. we can uh, leave a legacy, right. not only on our planet, but on our families while we are doing something that is ethically right. And, and that we believe in, right? I mean, the good no, guys. No, that's right. No surprise to anyone watching this, that we believe in climate change. Um, we're asympathetic right. to the oil companies right now who are tanking and, and having to figure their own financial structures out. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm so excited to have had a chance to have, uh, you know, you three who are extraordinarily well connected. You're also extraordinarily thoughtful in the way that you think uh, about how to help the companies that you're involved in. I mean, to a person, each one of you are literally hands on helping companies overcome this financial crisis and their, their hardships and struggles in your own ways. Uh, and it's really inspiring for me uh, to see how you are leveraging the connections, you know, with Mona at the government levels around the world and lenders and sponsors um, with Josh at, at, with manufacturers and the way that Jim, you've deployed the, the tactical experience that you've gained from deploying many, many megawatts into helping others just like you uh, get a foothold in, a, t in a, uh, a troubling economic time. You know, it's one of the um, it's one of the interesting ways that these um, that these conversations unfold. You know, we have a structure that we think we're going to follow, uh, and sometimes uh, things just get teed up perfectly. So. With that, I want to um, say thank you to you all as guests. Uh, I'm honored that you take time out of your busy schedule. We're all working 12 plus hour days. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and usher you guys back into the green room where you can hang out for a minute while I wrap this up. And I encourage you as watchers uh, and listeners to not go away just yet. Uh, I'm, as what I was just referring to uh, in terms of apropos is uh, we'll be partnering with uh, Radiant REIT and our friends at Antenna Group to bring this same conversation forward around how COVID-19 has impacted specifically solar finance and development on May 28th. I'd invite you to join us for that session. Uh, we'll be sending out uh, communication around how to do that, but you could go to the link that you see in the ticker down on the bottom uh, specifically. And if you're registered for Suncast Summit, which you can do at suncastsummit.com, then you uh, will see uh, you'll see in your email uh, a notification on how to join uh, this session with Jim on May 28th as well. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, apropos, grateful that um, somehow the, uh, the question sort of lined up to leave us on that final note. Really uh, also grateful for our esteemed panelists and uh, not the least of which uh, grateful for our sponsors who helped make this entire uh, show and platform, uh, our summit as it were, free for you to view. Thank you for joining us. Thanks to SunGrow, Radiant Reed, and many others who contributed to help give you the opportunity to join us uh, for free and enjoy these sessions. If you haven't registered yet, go to suncastsummit.com. Check out our agenda. The agenda for the rest of the day is phenomenal. Next Wednesday, uh, we'll be talking about the State of the Union of Latin America, kicking the day off with James Ellis from Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and many, many other conversations that are helping uh, you all to become educated and to specify exactly how you are going to attack uh, your career, your company as an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, uh, or simply someone who is, is looking to become engaged in this industry. I encourage you to plug in. Last but not least, I'd encourage you to specifically plug into our Facebook group, which you can find by searching Clean Energy Guild at Facebook. Join the Facebook group if that's a place that you congregate. Uh, and if not, then at least follow us on Suncast Podcast and uh, over at suncastsummit.com. We look forward to uh, engaging with you in our community and in other ways. And thank you so much for your time, which is, in fact, the, the non-renewable resources that you've given as a gift for us today. Thank you for that. And as I always say, 
uh, you are what you listen to, and in this case, what you watch. So uh, thanks for leaning in with us today, Solar Warriors, and we'll see you on the next broadcast.